my background, unlike many of the professors here at KGI, is um, I'm almost purely academic. So I've never been in the industry, never worked for a company. Um, uh, I've always went through academic uh, institutions. So my, uh, my experiences are very th theoretical, but nevertheless, I'm trying with Joel West to spin out a company from KGI that, that deals with drug discovery and development. Uh, but I don't, I don't have a lot of detailed experience that many of the uh, KGI professors have. Um, so <clears throat> what we start with, let's start with some basics, uh, basic definitions. Drug discovery and development belongs to a field called pharmacology. By, by definition, pharmacology is from Greek, it's a study of drugs or poisons. Um, there's two ways how you can study drugs. One way is what the drugs are doing to you, and the other way is what you're doing to the drugs. So if you study what the drugs are doing to you, you're studying pharmacodynamics. Um, is there a pointer? pointer? Um, pharmacodynamics, it's, it's the last point. It's what the drugs are doing to you. They can do good things, they can do bad things. The good things that the drugs are doing to you are they're curing you. So when you hear about drug efficacy or drug potency, so when you hear about drug efficacy or potency, this is what the drugs are doing to you. Uh, they can be bad things. They can be, um, they can be drugs have side effects. These are bad things that, that drugs are doing to you. Again, this is all pharmacodynamics. Another study that people do is uh, they study what we're doing to the drugs. So if you take a pill orally, the pill gets to your gastrointestine, and then our gastrointestines will absorb the drug and will, and will deliver it to some tissues or your blood and, and some other tissues. So uh, then the drug will be metabolized by us because we don't like foreign things in us. And then we'll excrete it through feces or urine or sweat or uh, saliva. Um, that's what we're doing to the drug. So this kind of study is called pharmacokinetics. <clears throat> so we teach that here at PGR. So another, another very basic definition is, what is a drug? By definition, a drug is something that you don't take every day. It's not part of your food, not part of your drink. It's something that you would take when you feel sick or if you want to feel better. Um, so <clears throat> again, as a, 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 as a person that studies drugs and develops drugs, we need to know um, what the drug is doing to a patient. Is, it, is the drug curing a patient? And also, what happens if a patient takes too much of the drug? What kind of toxicity will the drug cause? What are the side effects? Um, so we're talking about drugs in a very basic way. We're trying to group them in, in different ways. One way of um, grouping the drugs is by what is the source of the drugs. A source can be either a natural source or synthetic source. So a natural source is, a good example of this is aspirin. Do you, do you remember, have you ever heard of, of what was the original source of aspirin? An emotional document. <laughs> do you remember? Is it like the bark of a willow tree? Willow tree, that yeah, it's the bark of a willow tree. Used by uh, people for at least 2,000, 2,000 and 600 years. Um, so that's one example of where the drug is coming from a natural source. Um, if you look at some universities like University of Hawaii, their whole mission is to see where the drugs can be done from anything that grows on the islands and around the island. They have you know, libraries of, of compounds that are coming from natural sources or some mixture of compounds. Like, you, know, you have a sea urchin, you, you blend it and it helps you with something. They have that. Uh, so that's what we mean by natural sources of drugs. And then there is a synthetic source of, of drugs, something that nature, mother nature, may not have ever done before. It's man-made, it's a, a, a chemist or a medicinal chemist in a white coat that produced this kind of structure in the lab. So it's unnatural. 
And that's what we have to study this from, for both efficacy and toxicity. Or it can be a, a modification of a natural drug. So you, you start with a natural drug and then you modify it such that it becomes completely synthetic. So that's one way of uh, splitting or uh, uh, categorizing drugs into natural and synthetic. This is my favorite question on one of the exams. Can you, can you categorize your drugs into the students always don't remember as well. Um, another way of splitting drugs is by way how you administer drugs. You can take drugs orally, you can take drugs through your nose, through your ears, through your eyes, you can inject it, you can inject it into veins, muscles, under the skin, there can be a cream. So there's so many ways how you can take the drugs. And depending on how you take the drugs, the effect will be different. So if it's a cream that you apply on your skin, most likely the drug will be distributed only in that tissue. If you take the drug orally or you inject it, most likely the drug will be distributed systemically or across many parts of your body. So that's another way how you can categorize drugs, uh, by way how you administer and how it's being distributed. I mean, just by injecting a drug, you can inject it um, under your skin, into your muscles, into your veins, and, and so forth. So, so just that has uh, different uh, variations. So I won't go through this uh, next set, uh, set of slides, but just to give you a flavor, a, 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 a nasal administration will have a local effect, so just in your um, uh, head area. Uh, if, you are, if you are taking the drug orally or anything into your mouth, the, the drug will be distributed not just locally, but systemically. So um, you can categorize again. So we're talking about how do you categorize drugs? By the way you administer and how they're being distributed in our body. So another way of splitting drugs into groups is, uh, depends on what type of medicine they belong to. So I'm biased, I study infectious diseases. There's a group of drugs that cure infectious diseases. So that's one group. Other groups of drugs are trying to uh, cure cancer, heart diseases, you know, any kinds of uh, medicinal groups that you can split them into. So that's another way of splitting drugs in different categories. So everything we teach here in, at, at KGI, we're trying to uh, teach students how do you evaluate if the drug is effective, so the drug, what good the drug is doing to you, and what bad the drug is doing to you, how harmful is it. And so the way you evaluate these two aspects is by something that you may have seen today, or before, or will we'll see multiple times today again. This is how drug development and discovery work in a, in a pipe. In a pipe. Have you seen this today? Okay, so I take a big pride every year because I teach a uh, drug discovery and development course for uh, uh, first year students. They come to me in September. I'm very proud to say I'm the very first uh, professor who will ever show them that. And then they see it in every other class. And they say, well, Mikhail already you know, all the time, so you, you, can, you can speak things up. Um, the way this works is we start with drug discovery. Um, once you discover a drug, and that's, that's usually done in some kind of in vitro studies. In vitro means outside of animals. So biochemical assays, uh, cellular assays, or anything that doesn't involve animals. You screen a lot of drugs. Some drugs will show you some uh, uh, in vitro efficacy. So it means that they will inhibit some cancer cells or some bacterial cells or viruses. You will have to test it in animals. So that's called preclinical. And that's usually done on like small animals or large animals. Small animals are mice, rats, uh, chinchillas, uh, no, I'm kidding, uh, <laughs> rabbits, uh, guinea pigs. Large animals are dogs, unfortunately, um, pigs and, um, and primates. So once you show that your drug works in model organism with your disease, you're, you're approaching FDA and you're getting IND, so it's an investigational new drug, which basically allows you to perform clinical trials. So you go to the hospital and 
you're ready to test your compound on humans. And you go this into, you do this in three stages. Phase one, phase two, and phase three. Phase one is just few, few hundred people, you know, up to a hundred people, where they're all healthy, and you give them that drug of yours, and you ask, what side effects do you have? And if the side effects are minimal or not as bad, you can test it in phase two trials with few, few number of sick people. And if your drug shows some potency or efficacy in curing those few sick people, you're ready for a larger trial, which is phase three trials, where you have uh, hundreds and thousands of people with that disease. And if your drug works in curing these hundreds of people and thousands of people with that disease, F, you, you will file with FDA something called NDA. It's a new drug application. And FDA will sit on it for two years and upset a lot of companies, most likely, um, and then we'll, they will approve it. And then you're ready to sell the drug and, and bring back um, the money that investors invested into you. So let's, do still have time? Let me switch gears and just give, give you some basic, um, we'll come back to that again. But let's talk about drugs in more details. So um, you can further split drugs into two um, chemical classes, large molecules and small molecules. Have you heard about this before? So small molecules are usually also called pharmaceuticals. They're kind of uh, your, your typical organic chemistry structures. Large molecules are also called biologicals. They can be proteins, DNA, RNA. They're much larger than any of the small molecules. So at KGI, what I teach and what, what Anastasia teaches is only small molecules. We don't even touch large molecules. Large molecules at KGI are taught by other, other professors like uh, Larry Grill touches, uh, well, you know, teaches on large molecules. Uh, bioprocessing is bio, which is biological drugs. They only deal, mostly deal with large molecules at KGI. So in, in case you were wondering what's the difference, that's the difference. Uh, Anastasia and I will go over small molecules. So let me talk to you today about only small molecules. So just to show you some examples, small molecules are kind of, if you, if you ever took organic chemistry, um, I'm, I'm guessing you weren't big fans of that, <laughs> but you've seen these kind of structures before. Um, you, you still remember there's, uh, there's something called molecular weights in chemistry, so how, how large your structures are. So small molecules usually go up to maybe a thousand or a few thousand grams per mole of daltons. So one dalton equals one gram per mole. So small molecules go up to maybe thousand, two thousand, you know, the difference is kind of hazy between small and large in, in some cases. But the rule of thumb is that they're usually up to a thousand or two gram per mole. Let me give you an example. Lipitor, have you ever heard, if you ever watch the kind of night, night channels, they, the, <laughs> the, the ads go, they go for two minutes how great the drugs are, and then there's this monotone voice goes, da, 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 da. Uh, kind of your kind of side effects and uh, including sudden and unexpected death can occur. <laughs> so, which is, in my opinion, by definition, it's unexpected. Uh, unexpectedly, I died. <laughs> uh, so every drug, small molecule drug, has three names. Um, one name is, in this case, the drug is Lipitor. Lipitor is a brand name. <laughs> It's the name that a particular company gave to that drug, brand name. It also has a generic name. So the generic name is atorvastatin. So that's the second name. The third name is a chemical name. Your favorite, you know, one methyl, one benzo, da, 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 da. <laughs> three sentences. So that's a chemical name. That's only chemists will, will understand this. And if you buy this drug and you open the pamphlet, there will be some, uh, if, if, if you open the box, there will be a pamphlet in it. If you open it, often it contains this kind of uh, printout with a structure. You look at the structure, it's a small molecule. It's a, it's a classical pharmaceutical molecule. So the nice thing about small molecule drugs is that you can take them orally. They can be quite often, not always, but quite often packaged as a pill. So 
Uh, that's why I like working with these drugs, because in infectious diseases, which I cover, if there's an epidemic, which way is more practical to administer the, the drug to masses of people? By giving out pills or by having a nurse injecting pills into people? I mean, I cannot inject anything into myself. I'm scared of needles, my knees buckle. So I don't take a pill. So if you open the pamphlet, you can see a structure. The molecular weight is about 1,000 Daltons and the dosage is in weight. It's not a liquid, it's in weight. So in this case, it's 80 milligrams. So that's a classical small molecule. Um, another example, again, three names. Gleevec is a brand name. Um, there's a generic name and then a chemical name. Structure, classical, small molecule. The dosage is in weight, it's milligrams. And it's a pill. So again, it's a small molecule. Um, Let's take a look at this one. This one is Avastin, a drug that cures cancer. Um, there's no structure anymore. Uh, the size is 149 kilo dolphins, which means, which means that it's 1,049 thousands of dolphins. So it's by several orders of magnitude larger than the examples we've seen so far. And the, the dosage is no longer in weight, it's in, it's in volume. So just by looking at the name, you can guess that this is the monoclonal antibody. If you ever if you have, if you ever heard of this before, so it's a protein, it's a large beast protein. So in this case, I predict that if you take it orally, you will just degrade it and digest it and just eat it, and it will just come out of you without doing anything to you, anything beneficial to you. It's going to be a very expensive burger. <laughs> so instead of giving it as a pill you would inject it into you as four milliliters. It's an injection. So this is different. This is not a pharmaceutical drug. It's a biological drug. It's a large molecule. Okay? So uh, I have a few more examples of, of that. If you, know, if you like science, if, you, if you're still into it, um, monoclonal antibody is a large, very large protein. And it consists of numerous amino acids. If you look at the molecular weight of individual amino acids, they are in the same kind of um, category in terms of the weight as some of the pharmaceutical drugs. So an individual amino acid is approximately as big as small molecule drug that we take. But you have so many of them. So that's why the drug is by orders of magnitude larger than a small molecule. Okay, so one thing I wanted to emphasize again is that at KGI what we teach is drug discovery, but more specifically we teach target-based drug discovery. So I don't know if you ever knew, but the majority of drugs that, are being this, that we screen drugs against, there is a target against which we, we screen a drug. So in this field, a target is a specific protein. Uh, it, could be, it could be a specific protein that's when mutated is causing a disease. For example, uh, breast cancer. Have you ever heard of BRCA1, BRCA2? So it's a mutation in a gene, so let's uh, kind of, this drawing follows this kind of example. It's a mutation in a gene called BRCA1 that will, when mutated, will increase your chance of having a breast cancer. Doesn't mean that you will have a breast cancer, it just means that it will increase the chance. So this protein, this gene and, and this protein, in this field of drug discovery is called a target. And we as scientists will screen drugs to look for drugs that will inhibit m m this mutated BRCA1. So this is an example of target-based drug discovery. You, you always need to have a target in this kind of field. Um, so an example of non-target-based drug discovery is antacids, tum-tums. You take them orally, if you have a heartburn, it will make you feel better, but not because they inhibit any particular proteins in you. They make you feel better because they change physical chemical environment in your gastrointestine. They change pH, they change osmotic uh, environment in your, in your gastrointestine. You feel better. So this is an example of non-target based drug. But the majority of drugs that we screen and teach students here is how do you discover drugs in target based type of um, uh, science. 
So uh, we emphasize on the, the, those students really understanding well genetic. Everything starts these days with genetics. So we always say go to Anish. Anish <laughs> uh, will, will, will help. So if if you have a mutated gene that makes a protein that causes the disease, you will screen, we will screen a lot of drugs for those that can inhibit this protein. We'll find several uh, small molecule compounds, we'll modify them, we'll test them in animals, and then we'll test them in humans in clinical trials. So that's the basic kind of principle we teach here at KGI, but every single step in, in, in this pathway. So, if you ever wondered how does basic science fits into drug discovery and development process, um, it's this step here. Before you, before you screen your drugs and test them in animals and humans, the basic science is it precedes drug discovery. It can take up to five or ten years to really find the target against which you will screen the drugs. So basic science goes before your screening drugs, understanding what protein, when mutated, causes a disease. That takes many, many years. Um, so that's how basic science and then uh, applied science fit together in, in this kind of uh, scenario. Uh, we also describe um, um, pharmaceutical industry is big. If you just look at top 20 uh, companies that um, develop and discover drugs, um, just top 20, um, how many years is it? 12 years ago, they sold half a, half a trillion dollars worth in one year. If you look, um, 2016, just those 20 companies, not the whole by, by pharma, pharma, they sold uh, close to, you know, closer to one trillion dollars worth of drugs, just those 20 companies. So it's, it's a, the next few slides is just me showing how big of a footprint these companies have in, in the Western Union countries. Uh, Fortune 50 companies, yellow, are those that do anything with drugs, sell, manufacture, or uh, uh, develop. A, if, if you look at specific drugs, top selling drugs, top 10 selling drugs any new year, um, Lipidor, my example, if back in 2010, sold for in one year seven billion dollars worth. Just one drug in one year. Yeah. Exactly. If you look per geographical region, which region uh, sells most of the drugs? 2004, United States uh, sold 45 percent of, of all the global sales. Um, so you look at uh, 2017, same, nothing changed. The United States and Canada still are uh, the most selling regions of the world. So I tell my students that in this country, there's a lot of job opportunities if you want to do anything with drugs. Um, the, how about time? Is still okay? We have no, a break built in, so. Okay. So one thing I also go over with the students is that uh, kind of characterization of drug discovery and development. So how expensive and how lengthy it is in the United States. <coughs> so, um, <laughs> what I teach them is uh, it takes a very long time from discovery to approval. Uh, on average, it takes about 15 years. So, I kind of give them a, a point that if they discover a drug at the beginning of their career, if they're lucky, this drug may be approved closer to the end of their career, and they go, oh, what's the point? But uh, my point is that there are certain ways how you can expedite drug discovery development and make it more efficient. It doesn't have to take 15 years. It can take half of that time. So uh, I also teach them that um, drug discovery development is a very expensive process. It can take anywhere between half a billion to several billion of dollars to, from discovery to a development of a particular drug. Uh, although it's a controversial number because it, depend on, it depends on who calculates it. And so this particular um, scientist calculated that a drug, um, it, it cost about $2 billion to, from development, to, from approval to, to, to discovery. The way he calculated it is that a given company has multiple potential drugs in their pipeline. 
And if only one is successful and five are losing or will never be approved or will fail, the company still spends money on the failing drugs, which contributes to the cost of the winning drugs. So that's how we kind of, uh, in, in, in reality, this price bears in it a lot of failure. So uh, it kind of exaggerated the price a little bit. So you ever heard of pharma that is missing an A? It's PH army, so it's a kind of a very wealthy club for very wealthy companies. So a lot of the numbers that they report comes from them. Um, so if you look at where the time, if, if it's 15 years, where is the time going in, in drug discovery? So drug screening takes about um, five years. Can be can take five years. Animal trials take take another two years. Um, human trials take another six years. And then FDA on average takes about uh, half a year to two years to evaluate your new drug. So that's that's already about 15 years altogether. That's all. Yeah, that's long. And depending on which sources you look, it's you know, the number is about the same, 14 to 16 years. It's risky. So I love risk. Uh, that's why I never go to Las Vegas. I'll just I'll just spend everything I have. So I'm really my attitude in life towards risk is very healthy. I'm, I'm not afraid to invest resources into drug screening. Uh, but the problem is that no one guarantees you that after five years of drug screening, you will have a compound that is potential drug. You, at the end of the day, you may, may have spent years of your time, of your salary, a lot of dollars of resources from the company. You may be fired for that. And some people, therefore, are risk averse. They don't like that kind of science. I love it. Um, the, it's, it's risky because for every 10,000 compounds, only one may be approved. Not will be, but may be approved. Because it's a risk associated with it. It's also very expensive. So if you look at what far, this pharma, P-H-R-M-A, without A, um, spends, and the whole industry spends any given year is more than the budget of NIH in the United States in any given year. So it's a very expensive process. It, uh, companies spend a lot. They spend a lot, but they also make a lot. So you don't see them, you can't see the numbers. Uh, in any given year, uh, if, if all of these pharma companies spend $48 billion in that year, they sold close to $300 billion in the, in the same year. So they still, they invest a lot, but they make much more. It's a very profitable uh, business model. Where is the money going when they develop drugs? Um, is it preclinical, is it clinical? The answer is most of the money goes into phase three trials because it has thousands of people participating in these trials. You have to pay for their participation, you have to pay doctors, you know, beds in clinic, uh, nurses, and, and so forth. So a uh, third of that money when you develop drugs goes into preclinical, sorry, clinical trials phase three. Just that phase alone takes part of the money. And the last point I want to make, and I won't go into too many details, is that the, there's a trend. The trend is that drug discovery and development gets more and more expensive every year. So <laughs> if you look at the old study when it was first observed, um, over time, the amount of drugs being approved, it's, it's more or less steady. You know, FDA every year approves about 20 or you know, 10 to 30 drugs have, every year. But the cost to develop them increases disproportionately. So it's not that if you approve more drugs, you spend more money. The answer is if you approve more drugs, you spend even more money. I mean, it's, it's disproportionate. And the, the, there are many hypotheses why this has happened. One of them is um, comes from pharma reporting itself where they say, so this wealthy club where the companies belong to, they blame FDA for that. And their blame is the following, that FDA wants more and more. They want more data. As, as science becomes more and more abundant, as more um, technologies become available, FDA wants to know more. So I'll give you the example, an example. 
10 years ago or so, uh, genome sequencing of humans was still very expensive. You wouldn't even dare thinking about sequencing genomes of thousands of people. These days, it's inexpensive, it's, it's affordable. And so FDA may say, well, now that you are testing your drug in clinical trials, the company, go back and sequence genomes of all the participants. So that you may do an analysis how genome and side effects correlate together. Which means that a company has to go back to investors and say, we have been asked to do more studies, invest more into us. We have to go back to clinical trials. So um, pharma blames FDA for asking more from them. So that's, that's one of the answers that I've heard. Um, and then FDA may, may, may you know, revive it. 